Give me a week. I can take that four or five days. I can take that. We're all good. So no kidding. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here with Eddie Streeter, the head baseball coach at Legacy High School in Le- in Bismarck, North Dakota, the newest high school um, in Bismarck. He is also a former assistant, which is where I sort of met him um, at University of Mary during my time at University of Mary. He also played some years, years ago at University of Mary, which we'll start with in his early days. He is also a PE and health teacher at Simley. I don't know how many job titles he has attached to his name at Simley, but I'm sure there's even a few more that I am not even aware of. Streets, how how has the winter been going with some off-season? I know we're getting into some legacy open, open gym time, but how's the off-season been going? Man, everything's been good. I mean, we're getting started with, uh, you know, some open gyms a couple of weeks ago on the Sundays and, and some other workouts opening the gym up for the boys. So it's good. I mean, I think outlook for the weather stuff is always nice when you see less snow on the ground that you had last year and temps on the rise. So right now you feel pretty good about it. It's good. I was just in Arizona last weekend and the baseball fields down there look a lot better than ours do right now. I would have that. <laughs> <laughs> they take a little better care with them. I'm getting ready for spring training. I'm sure they're starting to groom some things. So they, they're looking real appealing down south. But no doubt. No doubt. So starting way, way back before before I was born, not to age you at all, but before I was No, nah, I'm old, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So I know I talked to, when I podcasted with Jordan Wilhelm, the head boys basketball coach over at BHS, we talked a lot about how he replaced a legend and um, kind of maybe the intimidating factor of stepping into those shoes. Um, And we'll get to your coaching career as we go here. But I know I've met your dad. I've been around your dad a few times. Um, You've told me, you and your brother have told me stories about your dad coaching you guys, kind of your dad's presence on the basketball court, the baseball field, and um, sort of just his demeanor. Um, What are some things early on, just as an athlete being coached by your dad, that you learned about coaching just through your dad from the early years? Um, I don't know if necessarily I actually learned it in my early years. I think it's experienced it more in your early years, right? Where you, you know, that age group of, of males who coached, you know, were very hard on kids, right? Were very demanding on kids. Um, I think at times they had some things that now I think is getting rooted out of coaching. Um, but more or less, it was just the experience of holding people accountable. Um, but also how to go about your business, right? I mean, they lived and breathed it and still do to, to some aspects, um, divulged all their energy into trying to be great at the craft, but also helping those young men that they got to coach year in and year out at their craft. But, um, I would say as a player, I didn't handle it that well in my adolescence. It probably wasn't until um, I got to junior college and started playing for um, my grandfather, who was the infield coach there, where I kind of made the turn to start understanding it more as informational instead of criticism. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, That the things that they'd get on me about wasn't because they were being critical. It's because they were trying to inform me of how things should be done or how they wanted things done. Um, so it didn't get any easier. I mean, my father is, <clears throat> I mean, for the lack of a better term, fairly legendary in Modesto, right? He was, um, you know, a handful of years ago, he was like one of the five, he got voted top five basketball players ever from the city. Um, was a two-time All-American in Juco baseball, um, played hoops at Fresno State. So he's legendary in his, his old man, which it's, you can, I know it's the podcast, but I have a poster of him behind me. It's the like the short hop logo, that's it right there um, of his AAA card back in the day for the Sacramento Solons. And um, his name was on the outfield wall of the junior college I played at because he coached there, um, obviously before my time as a head coach, um, but was an infield coach there. And that's when I kind of started to take that turn of they're trying to help me grow and, and help me become better at my craft, not criticizing me. Like I could see them on the weekends. They'd love me to death, but during the week during practice, they were tough on me. But Um, I think the biggest thing I learned was just how dedicated to the craft you have to be um, in order to be pretty good at it. Absolutely. I think I I found it interesting. I took a note of one of your one of your statements there with kind of how um, the way the way they were able to coach decades ago has kind of dwindled and gone away Mm -hmm. for some people who might not be able to handle that sort of coaching. Um, I've I've grown to like it more and more, um, especially 
um, observing you coach and just coaching underneath you. And it's not the, the aggression piece of it. I think it's the authenticity and the honesty piece of it. But one thing that just popped into my head as you were talking about that is you probably, you might remember a video surfacing on Twitter of um, coach Tom Izzo over at Michigan state, him and <clears throat> him and players getting into like verbal arguments in their team huddles and social media, just blowing up about how this shouldn't happen in a team huddle. And, but there are also guys who played for him and fans and people who are like they're competitors. This this is how they communicate. They they want the best for each other, and sometimes that causes some conflict. So that's just something that kind of popped into my brain right there. But I know I've again that's just a coaching style that's kind of died off over the years. Right. I think I think you hit the word though. Like there's some authenticity to me where coaches are still competitors. Most of them are former players, right? They use coaching as their competitive medium still, right? We want to compete at something. Um, even my own kids, we're very competitive in our household with things that we do. Um, I think the one thing that gets misconstrued is you see that out of context, just a, you know, pin in time of maybe that interaction between a coach and a player. And the only thing that really matters is that interaction between a coach and player is what those two individuals think what page that they're on i think too sometimes you see parents have that like oh they yelled at my kid like that well i yelled at them again because something happened that we didn't want to it doesn't mean i don't love them any less it doesn't mean i don't want what's best for them i think that's one of the most misconstrued things um in there but i do think that there's some authenticity to be yourself i think kids in general know when you're faking it when you're not being authentic to who you are no matter what age you are i think there's some uh misguided attempts by older teachers or coaches myself to maybe try to be too young and hip and that's not necessarily the case but just to be yourself and who you are and i think you and i have a awesome job where i think mentally it keeps us fairly young we're around young people all the time you know majority of our days around young people so i think mentally um and socially we can maintain young or have a pulse of what young people are thinking but i still think that at 40 years old i have um, a duty to myself to be authentic to who I am and and what got me here. So um, there are some things that I still take from that era. I think the accountability piece for sure and um, the authentic, like the being authentic uh, to who you are. But I do think as even I've gone throughout my coaching career the last long while here, 17 years or so, um, I very much have changed more from, you know, what that older thing, that older type coach might be with transactional you know, to more transformational for sure. Gotcha. So you kind of mentioned um, where you're from. Those are our viewers and listeners um, who don't know. Eddie is from California. He ended up making his way to North Dakota, which we'll get to momentarily. But can you talk about growing up in California? What area did you grow up in and kind of compared to other notable areas that people in North Dakota might have an idea of related to where, where everything is in California? Right. So Modesto would be like right in the middle of the Central Valley. So if you're looking at the state, it's basically if you went top to bottom in a straight line, it's probably right around the middle. Um, Modesto is about 60 miles south of Sacramento, about 75 miles or so um, southeast of San Francisco. Uh, Modesto is probably most famous for uh, George Lucas, who obviously invented Star Wars and Indiana Jones. He's actually as a Maya Thomas Downey graduate. Um, yeah, so I, I lived there for it's almost it's still a majority i've almost been out here a majority i got a couple a couple more years before the majority of my life's been out here but um until i was 21 I, I played high school ball there i played junior college ball in at modesto junior college and then came to mary in the fall of 2004 so so stemming from um your childhood upbringing from california how in the world did university of mary find you in modesto um, you, you know, you'd be you'd be amazed how many Central Valley people actually still live here or at that time went to you, Mary, when they were in AI, JUCO's JUCO products were a little easier to get. Um, normally, JUCO kids would cost a little bit more money. But when they were in when Mary was in the DAC and NAI, they could sort of stack you a little bit better with money. Yeah. Uh, but Myron and his football staff every year would make a trek through the Central Valley to all the JUCOs um, to recruit some some junior college kids. And one of his assistants met an assistant baseball coach of mine uh, at a coaching conference and they were just looking for some guys um, and I was I very much was average but I was um, average on a team that was really really good you know we had 
I think like seven draft picks my second year that ended up get, at some point in their, their career getting drafted. I think those seven guys all went on to play D1 at various Oregon States, Wake Forest, UOP, um, some other different schools. A lot of uh, some NAIs, me and a couple of the guys went NAI. Um, uh, my, <laughs> we joke, my, some of my last games at Marion <clears throat> in 2006, we played Dickinson State and Dickinson State. And us, I think out of the 18 starters, there was something like 15 of them were from California, played California yes. Jucos. And, you know, my my four roommates, the first year I was here, my four roommates all played at San Jose City College, and we played them oh, once in the preseason little weekend. Your sound yeah. cut out. My sound cut out? Let me see what we got. There, it's back. You got it? We good? Yeah, it's back. Uh, my internet must be just having a heyday today. It's all good. Can you cut that when you do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know when it cut out where I was at? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Myron and those guys would, would recruit up and down um, and get a bunch of California Juco guys. And, and I was lucky enough to be on a really good team with a bunch of first round draft or not first round, but a bunch of D1 guys and a bunch of draft picks where, you know, when we played, there was a lot of people there. Um, so I was lucky enough to be one of the average guys on that team, but you get, you know, a lot of credit for playing on really good teams. If you can get some tick on those kind of teams, you're probably decent enough. Um, and then I came out here, I met some of my bestest of friends and as, as a lot of us do, we stay because we met a girl and mm. then she ends up making you stay. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, 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 it was a weird journey. I think I had a three-year plan when I left, right. I, you know, I wasn't the bestest of students. So when I got to Mary, there were a lot of classes that didn't transfer. Um, Joan out there, Mary would always joke that if I could have got a degree in theory classes, I would have already graduated by the time <laughs> I transferred. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so, yeah, so I had a three year plan and three years have turned into, boy, we are going on year 19. No, I, this is year 20. So in the fall this year, I would have been here for about 20 years now, which is insane to say out loud. Pretty wild. Time time cruises by. It does, man. It's even, and you'll find this out as a as a newer father. It it's the one lesson you know. Parents always tell you the stuff about that you like that can't make any sense because some of these young days are are real long with those new kids. But boy, it it's I got a teenager in my house now, and it's something. It's something, bro. <laughs> I know you post videos of him changing the channel on the radio, and I'm like, there's no way this can be this kid can be this old already. I don't even it's recognize a, him anymore. I mean, he's 13 years old going on 65, man. Like it's <laughs> he's an old man, old soul for sure. For sure. Uh transferring classes at Mary. I've had nightmares about that a couple times. I remember a I'm, few of my teammates missing a couple practices, having to meet with all sorts of people because one word was switched on a class course or some bogus that just were ridiculous. Yeah. Well, are we had we had some assistant coaches who they would teach like um, a theory class, right? They were in uh, employed by the the junior college and they needed enough kids to fill their class and classes were super cheap there. So we'd make sure that we filled the class and it was like a two credit class. So they'd have 20 baseball players, but we wouldn't go. We just did it just so he'd have the class. Yeah. So all of a sudden you look at my transcripts and there's, you know, 20 credits worth of <laughs> there's 10 theory class theory of tennis theory of racquetball theory it's like <laughs> i couldn't tell you anything about any of those sports at the time you know what i mean but so uh, it was i was my fourth year of college taking you know psych 101 just to get those credits just to start towards my majors that that first semester was like hit you like humbly you were all excited about getting to a school playing baseball you know you're gonna play the whole your four years out which is a dream for most people but you're there with like 18 year olds who, you're sitting, you're sitting you know, in the auditorium with. Yeah, them. now if you look back, like you're, at, you know, yeah, you're at one of one of the halls in there, and there's 50 18 year olds from Hazen and Beulah <laughs> and Gackle, and you're like, what the, what the hell am I doing here, man? Like this is, but I had to get done. I mean, that those for that first year, I took a lot of credits just to get myself back in order, man. But yeah, three year plan to so then I could have graduated and. I got married instead. I got married about three months, two months after three months after I graduated. So, uh, yeah, keeping it moving. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wild, a wild story. I was, I was just, you, you just kind of stole the words. I was, I was thinking you're a 
a college senior at University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota, straight out of California, sitting near the bunch of small town North Dakota eighteen year olds. Yeah, it was more it was comforting though, because I said like my four roommates were all from a California JUCO in San Jose. They all played together. So we all experienced it together so we could ask questions to make sure like I wasn't the only one that like, hey man, like did we feel old in that class? Or <laughs> Is it is it if we have a party, is it not OK to have these people here? Like, how does this work? You know what I mean? So. All right. So you arrive at Mary. You have your you finish your playing career. Obviously, you talked about how life took a different course than you expected. Um, this is, of course, when you and I kind of cross paths as I was coming out. I mean, as yeah. a high school kid coming to you, Mary baseball camp every every Christmas break, I'd be out in the field yeah. house throwing the ball around. Um, so you'd stay at Mary. You coach there for a while. What did you enjoy most about coaching at the college level when you were at the college level? I think that there at the college level, I think that there's a very big like I loved the ownership and the needing to try to win. Right. I think that that was a, a huge thing. I think dealing with an older clientele was fun. Um, but I, I did very much enjoy the young men who were in the program. Um, I will always be indebted to Coach Walsh for allowing me to be as a, a GA and then hold me on as an assistant those last couple of years that he was there. Um, but I just the, the camaraderie of college baseball is something I don't think you really find anywhere else. I even get the, the pleasure now. Coach Spencer allows me to come out and do some defensive stuff with their guys. And you just get jacked up for your own season, just seeing guys like the camaraderie they have, the um, true um, authentic, like authentic enjoyment to see somebody else success, right? The um, constant positivity that they get to their teammates. Like there's nothing like it. And I, I'm sure other sports, other college sports are like that. There's just something different about, the at like the atmosphere of college baseball. I mean, you're a huge college football fan, and I don't know if you ever can replicate some of the things that college football does, but like baseball has that like that niche where like they just have something also that you can't replicate. Mm -hmm. You know that that well, camaraderie. Think, uh, that, uh, going to Omaha. I mean, how can right. you compare going to? O I've I've personally never been there for the College World Series. It's still on my list of things to get to, but I mean, just watching it on TV, you can just, it's different. It's, yeah. I mean, I honestly, if, like when you go here, here's my advice. When you do go, because we don't get to go all the time, right? Like some of these teams and stuff go all the time, go there, get a hotel right next to the stadium. There's like three in the back by the statue somewhere right there. Pay the money. It's way too expensive, but pay the money, but it's nicer to go in and out because they let you go in and out. But you just get to watch the buses pull up, like the fans, the people walking into the bars who are all just decked out in their team stuff. Like it's just a, an awesome environment. And you see just the different things college baseball has to offer. And I think college baseball, more than any other sport, is the demographic of your team is so diverse. You mm -hmm. can have, you know, a five foot five guy playing second base who can run, who can hit, who can throw a little bit, good ball player. You can have a six, 10 guy who throws 94 you can have guys from all over the country who are built so differently yet can do the either the same things or do so many different things to help your ball club win where you know for the most part in football you need to have a type exactly. uh, you have a type in order to get the job done or to be good where in baseball you can be whatever you want to be and still get that job done so but college, I, I enjoyed it a ton. I, I enjoyed that I got to stay. I enjoyed that I got to experience that part. In retrospect, I wish I could go back and maybe do less off the field. Like I worked a lot on the side just because I had just got married and, you know, husband duties feels like they kicked in. But if I could go back, I'd probably do that a little less and know we would have still got by and and sort of jumped into that coaching pool a little heavier. But um, I enjoyed the whole thing, man. I mean, there wasn't one thing that I'd go back and go, eh, that wasn't very good. No, I enjoyed it. I don't mind bus rides. I think bus rides are cool. I think you build, um, builds you some character, but also like helps you, um, engage in those relationships and try to build those relationships and have more conversation with people than just baseball. Absolutely. So eventually you get an opportunity to go coach at Bismarck high in town. So you kind of step away from Mary, um, you obviously are still have ties to Mary and all sorts of coaching staff at Mary. So as you mentioned, you're still out there with Spence doing some stuff. But you get an opportunity to go into town and coach with Jim Patton, who you, of course, still coach with over at Legacy. 
Um, and I kind of want to focus just with BHS before we get to the good old legacy days. Um, focusing on BHS, you had the chance to be part of the state championship team that was, as we both know, loaded with North Dakota talent. You had yeah. Quinn Iries, you had Dinga, you had Spooner, you had, I mean, I could name probably most of the team off the top of my head, like Ty Oakland. You had a team that better have won a state title or else something was going on. Yeah. Um, what did you learn as a coach from having such a talented group? Maybe expectations were pretty high. Maybe maybe there was pressure to succeed. Um, I know that group. Now, even thinking of leaders in that group, Cole Bauer jumps into my head. Yeah. Um, but you had so much skill, so much talent, but also a group that was able to lead themselves so well because they knew how talented they were, also because they've been together for so many years. So what were, yeah. um, what were some things you learned just coaching a group like that? Right. I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I beg, I didn't, Jim and I actually applied for that same job um, because Walsh has, was, had given up or had retired from you, married to move on to get a different job. So JP and I actually applied for that job together. He obviously got it, which was a phenomenal decision. Um, he's one of the most, I think he's one of the most underrated coaches around here. I've learned so much and he is um, tip top uh, of my coaching tree uh, of people who I admire um, so very much. Um, but he uh, let me come on and help that year. And then in 2014, um, he let me coach one of his JV teams because we had Man, we had like 70 something, 70 kids or something like that that year. And we said, hey, let's try to let's try to do four teams and spread it out and see if we can get everybody um, in the program some playing time. But I think he'd tell you, too, like that team, while there were some expectations because they we had won the 2013 WDA tourney. Yep. The title game got washed out against Dickey, but we were the higher seed. So we get the one seed going to the state tournament. And we lose a heartbreaker. It's the one thing I'll, Jim will always like be bummed on himself. He got Spooner thrown out at the dish to end the game to tie it. Um, we all know Spooner is not necessarily fleet of foot, right? He <laughs> runs like he skates. But um, so there was some expectations going in because we had so many returners. But I don't know if skill really rings true with a ton of that group. But they had some unbelievable elite competitors. Mm -hmm. They were at that. Those guys were in that probably that last tier of when Bismarck High ran like a yep. lot of the sports, right? Sure. Football was heavy. Track hadn't been beat in a gazillion years. Um, their girls team won a state title in like in basketball. They're like 2012 or something like that. 11 with Ronderos. Sounds yeah, year? somewhere in there. I graduated nine maybe. Or something. Like it was. We were yeah. It was a bunch of guys who had grown up knowing they were going to be Bismarck Demons and had seen them have so much success. Um, so I don't think necessarily uber skilled. I mean, obviously, I mean, Spooner, uh, from a hockey standpoint, super skilled. A lot of hockey players, they had won hockey that year, right? Mm -hmm. So it was the first West state hockey title, I want to say ever, but I think that there was one before them. But uh, I think there was a couple before, but it had been a long time. It had been a long time, right? So I think the one thing they had over anything that I really, I don't know if I've seen close. We've had maybe one crew at Legacy that has been that competitive. Um, but they had some elite competitors. I mean, I think it starts with guys like Quinn Irie, who is respected by everybody who's ever played against or with. Um, I think when Quinn spoke up and said things were going to get done a certain way, everybody did it. And guys like Cole were always at the forefront, too, to hold other guys accountable and weren't afraid to do that, but also not necessarily take it personally. Um, but there were also like, we tell stories and they're inside stories of guys who would go after each other in practice, like truly didn't like to practice with you because they'd compete at something and they wanted to, to win at all costs. But then as soon as you step on the field and we're wearing the same uniform, it was like, nobody's getting in this circle. Like we're not going to take, um, not necessarily losing, but we're not going to take an inferior effort from anybody today on a given day. And they hit a little, they hit a little skid, like two thirds of the way through the year, you know, where they were probably, I forget how many losses they had, but they weren't a, they were top four or five. See, they might've been the five, four. Um, and then they just caught a heater, an absolute heater. They, they played, we played Mandan in the second game of W day that year in Dickey. And it's, I always joke from a visual, like seeing a catcher throw down. Quinn had the best throw down to second base I've ever seen in game from a high school player um, to get a big out. I think it was like in the fifth or sixth. Um, we end up winning that game and then beating Century the next day to win the title. And then 
um, played really well. The state tournament had a um, really tough game against Dickey in the in the second game there. Uh, I think we won on a walk off. Yeah. And then the state title game was awesome because it was, was an crazy. hour and I think it was an hour and eight minutes, hour and five minutes the whole game. I think yeah. we scored three. We scored three in the bottom of the first, I think. And then nobody scored again until the seventh. Um, you know, Dinga pitched the second game. That was when before they had a pitch limit, they had innings limits. Do you remember that? It was like yeah. 12 yeah. innings for the tourney or something like that. And, uh, you know, we played as clean as it gets. I think Spoons had a couple errors. He had one on a fly ball that I don't think we'll ever let him live down where it was just a, a candy fly ball that he just flat out healed. There's ever um, an opportunity to hold the, get anything against Jared Spooner, you have to hold on to it for a while. Right. And, you know, there was a, um, and, and there's a couple things that we always go back to in that game. We spent probably three hours at um, Kroll's and Mandan that morning talking about who was going to start because the day before <laughs> Cole and Giesler threw, but it had rained and it was bad. So we wasted some innings and guys didn't feel good about it. So we we decide on who we were going to start, who I forget who the group had decided who was going to start. And we're walking out of curls. And this is all you got to say about the team. Like Dinga texts JP and goes, hey, I'll take the ball today. Thank you. Like that was all the text was. So Jim yells at us as we're walking to our cars like, hey, Dinga's going to throw today. He just texts me. So we're good. I'll see you at the ballpark. <laughs> you know, and it's, so it's just small things like that where guys just wanted to compete and they wanted to beat you and they wanted to beat you bad and, and they'd do whatever it take to do so. So it's not necessarily that they were – unbelievably skilled but mm -hmm. they got everything out of their skill with how hard they competed i just remember playing with a very large percentage of that group when we went down to texas for the senior babe ruth world series and i was 18 and everything you just spoke to it wasn't like they were like what they weren't being recruited left and right from all these big schools and nope. they just enjoyed playing baseball and they were they're good at it and when I when I graduated and they were still younger than me, I said these guys are going to win some state titles, and it's and it's they're going to make it yeah. look pretty easy too because they're just competitors and they just know how to win and they play together as a group. Yeah, that that last three weeks was one of the better heaters I've seen. I mean, even it, we we had to pull Dinga with one out. Uh, he gives up a leadoff triple in the seventh. Yeah. Gets the next guy to fly out, so it's three one two outs, and he's got to go make a change. And he asks uh colton ford who was just a platoon guy awesome kid his little brother played as a sophomore so there he is not really playing a bunch but his little brother's playing the outfield and we go colton do you feel more comfortable at second and third and colton goes second for sure and jim goes okay good go play third and we're all <laughs> like dude like that what kind of question was that and swear to god we talk about you know you're a baseball guy the baseball will find you right you put somebody in a weird spot try to hide somebody in the playing field like a ball is going to find them and without a doubt, the next pitch, Cole comes in and it is rocketed down the third baseline. And Cole snags it on like a long in-between hop backhand and threw an absolute dart, like just an absolute seed to first base. And we were like, we, we just started laughing because it was just one of those things like kind of had meant to be where you put a guy in who hadn't played in probably yep. a month, maybe. And the first pitch, he makes a play like it's his job. You know what I mean? And guys were just uh, just big on that. And you had some some other guys who just – they were great team guys. I mean, there wasn't a problem on – you know, there was nobody who complained about PT. There was nobody who – you just wanted to be – you just wanted to win and beat guys. And and so I'll be forever grateful for getting to live that part that JP let me have. Correct. So we fast forward to a more so present day. You get hired at Legacy. You replace um, Zach Wentz. I'm not – completely sure how that process happened i'm as from my own point of view it was more so obviously carson gets drafted by the eagles so zach yep. moves out east to um be with him and his foundation and everything else that carson had going on at that time so you come in and you take over the program at legacy i even when i'm coaching football i tell so many people that i'm <clears throat> i personally am so so fortunate and so grateful to be part of two staffs that um, not only do things the right way, but we we coach the we coach the right way and for the right reasons. Sure. And aside from that, it's two completely different age groups. I have fifth and sixth grade football, and I have JV slash varsity baseball, and we all have the same mindset, the same not necessarily the same style, but we're all there for the same reason. Um, so no matter how much talent the program at Legacy has had, you've always took great pride in being developmental. You talk about 
kind of your approach as um, I, like I said, we've had some seriously talented teams that right. <clears throat> one almost, I mean, potentially could have won a state title. We just ran into the buzzsaw of West Fargo Cheyenne, but no matter how much talent and skill and baseball players we have at legacy, um, you've never changed our approach of being a, a developmental program. So you can, can you talk a little bit about um, just the aspect that the developmental piece has had on the program? Right. I mean, I consider myself, I mean, you've had jobs you haven't got or, or wish you would have gotten certain different jobs, perhaps. And the first legacy job that opened, one of the big reasons why I went from college to high school right away in, in 13 was so I can get some high school experience because that was the feedback I had got from my interview. And I knew that the legacy job, they were going to start hiring coaches for when it opened to start the program. And Zach got the job and and Zach's awesome. Him and I have all, always had good conversations and, and he's a great coach and, and a great person, obviously. And I think anybody in their right mind would have done exactly what he did if your brother got yeah. drafted and was a stud like he is where you can go help him run such an awesome organization. Um, but it also was great for me because I got to you know coach with with Jimmy for a few more years, which taught me so much, especially about um, some leadership things and, and understanding how to deal with players at that level and that age group. Um, from a developmental standpoint, I think the development hadn't quite started then in terms of it being my main focus. My main focus at the time when I got it was to try to change the culture of some of the things. I think that there are kids obviously in that like 17, 18 group who aren't huge fans of me and I get it. Like I was really hard on them. Um, we very much held them accountable for every small thing. But it was this the approach of trying to change some of the culture stuff to what I think lends itself to long term success, not necessarily winning a ton of ball games, but getting kids to help them reach their goals. Right. I mean, um, I'll give you a, an example like and you were part of this where we had a, a young man who uh, we had to kick off the team for behavior issues my first year. You know, there's a lot of conversations throughout the year and it was a grind, even though I don't like the word grind. And it was, it was a lot because we weren't winning games. We weren't great. We had some great individual talents, not a great team in terms of, of wins and losses. Um, but we kick them off the team right before W day for behavior issues. We set a bunch of boundaries that first year, the next year he comes back, he is our one all WDA player. And for a time being had like our home runs lead, right? Just because I think, we set some boundaries. It took longer than I thought, but we set some boundaries and he came back and was a phenomenal player um, and leader. Uh, 19, I catch a lot of heck off, <laughs> off the field because I started a bunch of freshmen, right? You were there that year in 19 where yep. we had, that was like Paxton senior year, right? Where we started, yep. boy, one, two, three, three freshmen, I think. No, four freshmen, three sophomores, a couple seniors, right? Um, but again, I think that was thinking long term. Like, I think these guys need to have the experience of doing this. Um, that team eventually was that 15 year old team that, uh, made it to the world series. Um, and a lot of, a lot of really good things that have come out of that group, but it took a while. But my whole point about development is you watch coaches who coach for a long time. You have to have a special type of team or the utmost of lucks to win state tournaments. Right. I mean, I think if you look at any state tournament team or any team that has won a state tournament in most high school sports, they either have a ton of horses or they just catch a heater at the right time. I think summer baseball is the biggest um, like outlier for that, where you're looking in whoever is playing the best at those tournaments are yeah. going to move on. You take a couple years ago, post 400 had a terrible regular season. they are a few outs away from the series. Williston, same thing last year, the state tournament, they make it all the way to um, the regionals. So you, you have these things where um, you have to get lucky to win a state title or you just have to catch an unbelievable heater. Um, but you have to have the right kind of players. Right. And I think in high school sports, you should have peaks and valleys. And the more you can level those out, the better. And I think that started in about 2018, 19, where I said, I want to develop more kids. I don't want to have a program where you as a JV coach can do the same things that I want these kids to do at varsity at that level, hold them accountable to the same things, but then provide them with all of the things for them to develop their skill. Um, and that's taken over for me. And, and some people have asked, well, isn't a state title important? Like, yeah, it is like everybody wants to win. I don't think that that's the deal, 
But if you were to ask me right now, would you take a state title over other things? I'd say no. And the reason being is I have kids. We've had kids in the program the past four years who have gotten to reach their ultimate goal. They wanted to start varsity. They wanted to play varsity. They wanted to be good enough to go play college baseball. They wanted to graduate with honors. We had a couple of valedictorians this last year. Like our kids' personal successes have been so often now that it's become, again, part of the culture where if you do these right things, you have a chance to reach your goals. And so that that, that to me really, when I started thinking about it and talking to different people about it, um, and Coach Kincaid, who I coach with in the summer, is has been instrumental in those conversations with me of how do we want to compete and how do we want to develop players? Because then the more we develop, you assume the better players you have, then you can assume that the more games you're going to win and the higher your chance is of winning a state tournament. I mean, you you had mentioned that 2021 team where we run in, ran into Cheyenne, and those guys had played together for a long time. Those guys had developed their skills over a long time. Our guys that year were all the guys in 2019 who were super young. We took a you know, bunch of a flack for playing them. And all of a sudden, a majority of those guys are playing college baseball or at least attempted to play college baseball. Um, some of them are, are playing now. And, and even the young guys on that team who are now seniors are going to get to play college baseball. So that's a really, a really, to me, that warms my heart way more than I think any state title would be. State title would be kind of a selfish thing that I feel like I need that to validate something. I think more or less is our kids are reaching their goals. And I think that that was the number one thing when I really turned to more of a development style um, program instead of just, hey, we have to win a state tournament every practice. I think that that's mm -hmm. not necessarily the best case. The day I started coaching youth football, my dad, who has been doing it for 36 years a now. Million, and a coaching. million years. <laughs> yeah. he's. I think he was here when the whole entire thing started. Actually, it was just a couple of years after that, but um, guess, yeah. I'll never forget. He said, I didn't really understand what he was talking about at the, at the moment because I was young and probably wanted other things associated with winning and winning championships than just coaching youth football players and did not quite understand what he was saying until a couple of years down the road. But he said in five, 10, 20 years, not a single person on this planet is going to care how many youth football titles you have, just so you know. And at the moment, I'm like, OK, duh, like nobody's I'm not going to put on my resume. But the more I I mean, we have some really good coaches in our league, but we also have plenty of coaches that come through that. It's like, dude, you need to put the headset down and just, you know, these guys are these guys are 10 years old. But now right. I, I still tell people every single year I I'd saw I actually podcasted with a former player. Um, a couple months ago, Logan Schaubert, who is now at North Carolina. He, oh, good people. oh, yeah, good old Schwabs. But he, I, I told him and I tell all my formers, I say the, the best the best moment of my college career wasn't even when I, went at, when I was coaching. It was watching those guys win a state title at BHS. So I wasn't even on the staff. It was just a bunch of former players that got to experience all that. And um, it means they kept playing football. They enjoyed it. And obviously, they were successful from it. So it's definitely a quote that my – that sticks in my head. I mean, even at the varsity, even at the varsity level, yeah, it's great to win state yeah. titles, but where do you guys end up is end up in life is, is a major part of it. So, right. You've been, you've been a part of some of my end of the year talks, right. With, with inevitable last games of the season. And I always discuss that no matter what the tournament brings or what the end of your career or year brings, like it should never, ever be the worst day of your life, nor if you won at all, should it even become close to your top moments in your life. Like I could win a state title and it'd be up there for me personally, but it's never going to out, it's never going to outrank having my two sons getting married, um, moving, buying a house, all these sort of things that I find to be monumental in, in life, like getting uh, a couple of different degrees, graduating, um, it won't overtake that personally because those are so near and dear. So it's not even going to be close to that. And, and it's not going to be the worst thing ever. And I, and I, I go back that year in 21, I was, I was really struggling. My mom was, was dying from Alzheimer's. She was going downhill pretty quick. And I remember like, if we lost that third, fourth place game and you could tell we, we spent all our energy on the day before with Cheyenne and, and really just didn't have it the next day. But I knew that that day wasn't going to come close to the worst day of the year for me. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, 
you know, you you had talked about uh, your buddy Darren, like that year was Paxson's senior year. Like there was no way, no matter what happened that year, was that going to be the worst day of Paxson's year, let alone life, mm -hmm. you know? And so to me, it's about what memories can you make? What impacts can you make in that year? Um, what can you go look back on? I'm at the age now where a lot of my former players are have gotten married or getting married. I have a couple players who now coach with me, right, with, with Sigity and, and Dill's mm -hmm. coaching. Um, some young you marry guys. So it's, you get to the point where it's starting to turn full circle. And, and Jim talks about that a lot where some of his first players, you know, are much, much older, right. Who have kids who are in their teens and stuff and, and seeing that those are bigger deals, getting invited to weddings are bigger deals, getting to see, um, your former players, kids are a big deal. Um, those kind of things to me now hold way more weight than, than chasing, a state title ring for example plus my wife gives me hell because she jokes that the one thing we all play for are rings but she coaches at century so that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna fight about that all day long so <laughs> so stemming from a lot of the um, not just team success but a lot of our guys i know we have several at university of mary we have butsy committed a few weeks ago vasey yeah. just committed recently um, yeah. so again, guys that not, not focusing on, Hey, we have to win a state title this year, but guys developing, there's that word developmental developmental yeah. program again. Um, and Vasey's a, a little guy, we go back to the size. How about, um, these guys showing up to the ballpark and Vasey's what five foot five guy that'll just tear you apart left and right on a baseball field. Yeah, and now say he's five ten. I don't believe it. I don't know. I love him to death. That's, that's my guy, man. But I don't know. Like a few oof, inches, base. You're not, you're not tall. You're not tall. But Remember. he is though, right? Like that's the thing. Like you look at, you look at Marcus. Marcus looks like he weighs 120 pounds, but is really, really strong. Vasey's right. not all that tall and just does really good things. And um, I think they all have. And you've you've been around guys like that. They just have the certain characteristics of guys who have goals and are going to do whatever they can do to reach those goals. I mean, I'm you and I, I think we like the you Mary commit deal a little bit. That's our alma mater, right? We care yeah. deeply about that school and those programs. Um, it's been a plus that we've had kids good enough to go there. I think sometimes people may look at, Oh, it's just a hometown thing. Well, I can tell you right now that college coaches don't recruit hometown people because they think it looks good. They need to win. They need players who are good. Enough. Agree, They're not going to so waste money. Them. Yeah, they're not going to waste money and time on kids who aren't going to help their program, you know, in some some form or fashion down the road long term. So it's been good there. You know, Ben and and now Vasey are going to patent Patton and Vasey are going to be at Jamestown now, which is great. Um, you know, Ike's going to go to BSC and I think he's going to do really well in that conference. And we got some other guys that might be on the on the hook. And I think the next year we'll have two or three guys who I think this will be a big year for them to get their name out there and, and see what they can do because they have um visions of playing college baseball themselves but i just don't think it happens by not developing guys i mean wilhelm wilhelm after his i watched a little bit of the century bismarck high basketball game last night and he was talking about a lot of them they have a lot of football players on that basketball team and how long it kind of takes them just to get in the flow and develop um the skills necessary to play how he wants to play and um the skills necessary to play in that kind of system like you do have to develop those things and you have to be okay with the processes and i don't think we i think people put too much on what the outcome is on things you know and i think the other thing that i've really enjoyed about the development thing is wanting to do what we do very well i think sometimes in sports me and coach horner kind of go back and forth on this sometimes where basketball is a little different because you game plan based on what other teams do Yep. right um baseball you have more or less an idea of what they like to do right so if you're facing somebody who does play small i mean you probably have to to roll in some bunk coverages a little heavier in practice if you um have somebody swinging more swing and miss teams you got to just be more um, cognizant about you know pitch selection and what we're throwing and things like that but at the for the most part we want to be able to do what we do and do it well and do it best and make teams sort of um you know change for us and I think that's a cool thing about development is if we can get really, really good at what we want to be good at, you know, you sort of force teams hands to pick. Are you going to be better than us doing us things? You know what I mean? Um, where I'm not worried. I shouldn't say it like that. But our topic in practice when we're doing stuff isn't 
you know, is this going to beat so-and-so? Is this going to beat this team? Mm -hmm. Is this going to win us a state title? Our entire goal is, is this going to get us better today? Because if it's a no, then we're not doing it. Now, does that mean we're going to get better at something every day? Probably not. Like, there's days you just don't have it. Days mentally you need a timeout. Um, but can we get better at something that day? Sure. Maybe we just need to get better at rest. You know, as bad as that sounds, and, you know, you're a, a teacher. Sometimes we need a break. We need a timeout. Mm -hmm. um athletes do too i think we take some pride in those wednesday practices that we try to have indoors where they can see some trainers you know some leadership talks um we just sort of have a little competition and more or less have more conversation instead of just doing baseball stuff all day so i think it just i mean it opens up to me it opens up so much more avenues of of quality time around the game of baseball that i truly enjoy whether it's conversation about your favorite movie shoes you know, I always joke, I have a lot of conversation about dudes, what they're wearing to prom. You know, hey, who you going with? What you wearing? You know, what's the style like? What colors we wearing? Mm -hmm. um, those different kind of things that I think are fun, you know what I mean? And and trying to get them to know, to get them to, to know them as, as deeply as possible that we would consider, you know, still appropriate for player-coach relationships. But um, I think that development piece is something that I think it's missed so much. But in, you're in teaching, too, where sometimes you want to, like teachers who go out on a limb to try to build those relationships, there's, there's still there, that risk is much more, right? Like that you're mm -hmm. trying to help a kid and that blowback sometimes isn't as good as you want, whether it's from parents or other people, because it's you put yourself out there to try those things. Um, so it was for a while there, it was tough, but I think now we're in a place where like yourself, you come coach for us. This is how we do things and we do things for the betterment of the kids. And that's, that's our entire, you know, philosophy. We want to develop and make it better for the kids. I always find it interesting just observing and listening to your your conversations with your players because obviously I come from a elementary standpoint. So when you're talking about the drip and all this stuff with prom, <laughs> yep. like I'm listening and observing and I'm enjoying it. It's not like, okay, this is really weird and uncomfortable, but I'm like, this this is not the conversation right. I'm used to having. With a yeah, bunch of I even have to change it too. Like the middle school stuff, you know, like – the high school kids give me enough credit for being hip enough and being young enough as much as Modesto not, is not necessarily hip. I think that when they think California, they think you're cooler than you are um, or dumber. It's, it's a total, it's a fine, it's a fine, fine line. Um, but I, even I have to like, understand, like sometimes I'll just get in a group of practice. I'll go to school and like kind of start conversating with kids. Like I conversate with my 18 year old about to graduate kid. And it's like, wow, that's a little different. That's just a different, yeah. You know, and, and as a father, too, I, I, I would say that I probably am a little different from my verbiage I use at home than a lot of fathers. I don't, again, I'm pretty authentic at home as well. Um, but even then, I got to watch myself like, dang, I probably shouldn't play that song or yeah. use those words. Or even my kids are smart enough now to know who the hell I'm talking about. So I'm like, I probably should probably limit <laughs> that, too. You know, Boston's around the yard too much. He knows when I say, like, oh, hey, yeah. but, you know, hey, Marcus, this or. Ike this, Jameson this, you know, Cooper this. It's like, oh, he knows now. So it's like, ah, probably need to keep that under <laughs> wraps right. a little bit. But, you know, you're 100% right, man. That that uh, how we talk to young people is such a fine line between needing to be an adult and them needing to understand what I'm trying to tell them on their mm -hmm. level. Correct. I, I I even take the elementary mindset home sometimes and Kaylee, Kaylee will give me the look like quit talking to me like I'm 10. I'm like, sorry, I, I get paid to do this all day. So I right. have to rewire myself. And then and then I have a one year old running around. So I'm like balance right. like yeah. all sorts yeah. of stuff. Around yeah. Here. yeah. Bluey coming out of your ears. You know what I mean? Oh, pretty much some trash. <laughs> truck. Can't go wrong. Some trash truck. It's all we watch right. here anymore. Oh. But I think for for me, though, like it's it's still a work in progress because, you know, like you had mentioned early in terms of how my coaching thought processes have changed my whole life. I played for high school. I played for a guy who I didn't really like. We didn't get along. He was kind of mean isn't the word, but just it wasn't a vibe. But I played for my father. I played for my grandfather, who were both hard nosed old school coaches. My junior college coach was. Uh, a hard-nosed guy. He's one of my grandpa's best friends. He was hard-nosed guy. Got after it. When I got to marry, I had like that year where we had like an interim, and that is whatever. But then I played for Walsh for a year, and we both know he's a little short Irishman from Mandan. Like he get after you a little bit. You know what I mean? Like 
it was very easy to read his body language on a on a baseball field. Um, and so not right, a better right away, BSer like, in the Midwest than Coach Wall. I think he's right. top tier right there. Um, he's he's something, man. Coach Wall. He's still when he sends me a text, he's still like signs it like I don't know who the hell's texting me. I've like, just never my phone for 20 years, man. What do you mean? Or he'll just get mad. I call him Coach Walsh. It's Brad. No, it's still Coach Walsh. And you just have to deal, right? But you know, he was, you know, he's hard and and he was he'd get on you um and expect a lot out of you. And then, you know, JP kind of was at first where he held you accountable, but he wasn't Jim's never been a kind of in your face guy, loud guy. And kids have loved him for that. Like kids, it's it's my one thing that Yes. I still haven't necessarily been able to replicate, but he has such a an a f- awesome way where kids just want to win for him too. You know, they just love him to death, same as I do. Um, but I think over the course of time, I mean, that was when I first started coaching. So that that type of coaching is all I really had had. So then you sort of evolve eventually over the course of probably the, this, these past 10 years, because I was out of it a little bit when I had my first kid. You evolve over like the past 10 or 11 years to – what I think is now what I enjoy the most and what I think produces the greatest dividends. Um, so it's still a process for, for me to learn, to keep learning how to coach and how to coach at this level, the older I get. Um, because I do know that as soon as I either stop evolving or I can't get through to kids then it's just my time to stop doing what I need to do. So I think it's uber important, no different than coaching philosophies, right? Like how you go about doing things um should evolve over time this is still very much work in progress for me so for anyone who follows streeter on twitter you might notice the hashtag gymr um numerous occasions in the varsity dugout i can recall um especially in big moments as well mostly when i'm in the varsity dugout is during tournament time but even I can recall just in the past couple of years, like chilling next to Huck or chilling next to Trav in the dugout. Um, and I know Huck has always highlighted that he always, he always would turn to me and say, Streeter always knows what to say to these guys. He always, in the moment, he he's never over the top. Um, I know all of your guys who are successful at the varsity level know how you operate. And they, I know they, they embrace that and they, they love playing for you. At least I'm, pretty sure they all in, embrace and enjoy playing for you. Um, but the GYMR, of course, stands for Get Your Mind Right. So yeah. what does Get Your Mind Right represent to you? And what do you want your players to get out of it as they come through the program? Right. Shout out to Coach Huck and, and Stevens up there in Washburn. I mean, I think I, I hope most players – I think that as much as you would love to bat a 1,000 kids, you're just not, right? I think there's going to be some kids who don't like their experience, whether they they – their experience is solely registered on playing time or getting a shot or what have you. I'm not going to make everybody happy. And it's the old coaching stuff. Go sell ice cream if you want to make everybody happy. But I think if I still sold ice cream, there's people still be pissed. I didn't have their flavor, you know. Um, but I stole Get Your Mind Right. You know, there's uh, uh, some infield guys um, that I stole it from because it kind of hit home with me in terms of like how we need to think about things or how I like to think about things. And there's times where I have to take my own advice with that. But the get your mind right thing is just trying to be in the present. Like what is your job at this very moment, right? Getting your mind correct on what your objective is. I think so many kids lean on negativity. Like, for example, I've, I'm i really trying to eliminate the word grind from my vernacular because I think that <laughs> – I saw um, your tweet and I can't stand the word either because oh I, my I mean, I, I get it. And I get that the word grind is cool. But to me, like it takes what it takes, right? You want to be good. You have got to get your mind right about what it takes. So to me is, do I have to do extra work to get to my goal? Yes. Okay. Get your mind right. Go do the right work. Go do more work. Does it take going to open gyms? Yes. Get your mind right. Like get your mind around the fact that yes, this has to happen. Uh, get your mind right that, Hey, Maybe we had a bad call, not go our way. Happens. Get your mind right about what the next pitch is. I think so many things in baseball um, happen negatively because our thought process is super negative. Mm-hmm. Right? I think you can. For I'll give you an example. Historically, like when Century was just beating everybody, like Feeney's year, right, and, and Dalton year, and, and those guys, you pulled up, and the first thing people were like, like, I ain't got no shot. Yep. Got no shot. Nobody in the. And I get it. Like we probably, we probably didn't, but there were times in the game we did, but because our mind wasn't right, because we were playing the best team in the state, you just sort of fold and you, 
you get to that pressure point and you just fold under it because you've already determined like what your outcome is right um so i always too follow that up with you know we don't have to be perfect we just have to be better and part of that better and that now i took that from coach doves too so i gotta give doves his credit on that one right don't have to be perfect you just have to be better um but we do like we just have to be better with our thought processes and and how we go about getting ourselves in the right mind frame to do what we feel like we need to do to be successful whether that's finding a clearing mechanism when i'm at the plate because i was a bad call i make an error i have a bad at bat um i make an out you know whatever the case may be. and i got to do the same thing i'm not <laughs> i'm not gonna be perfect in my coach call i call plays that don't work out or get guys thrown out like that's just the way of it i want to get my mind right back to center of what exactly my um, process is and, and what i want to accomplish so getting your mind right is just something i sort of started that i stole just because i want kids to start thinking better about what they're doing you know and, and i think that the more positive thoughts we can have the more positive outcomes we can have i think we get so coaches too right like i when i say players coaches got to be held accountable for this too like when i get to practice my mind's got to be right about what i want to do in that practice mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's come from years of teaching too. You've had it, you have a bad day in the classroom, you come home, you're like, ah, you know, you don't want to bring it home with you. And now as a father, you definitely don't want to take it home with you. No. Same thing. Like my kids are a little older now. So my old, <laughs> my youngest one kind of trolls me about losing sometimes, but, um, you know, it used to be like, they come home, they didn't care whether you won or lost. They didn't care how your game went or what you did. They cared that you were home. You know, so getting your mind right in, in what is necessary in, in that present moment is is to me a, a big, big thing that, that we try to convey and, and try to get kids to buy into. Whether or not it works for everybody uh, is is yet to be seen. But you can usually tell the kids who don't have success, I would wager a guess that one of their biggest roadblocks is that most of their thought process is negative. Again, that's why I don't like grind. To me, I think grinding of brakes, grinding of teeth, grinding of gears, like none of that seems smooth or positive to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it seems rough and and rigid and and negative, right? Something's going to break or not working effectively. So to me, um, doing what it takes and doing executing what is required is a big one that we're going to do this year is all about getting your mind right with those things. I always thought the word grind is the people who are actually grinding don't actually use the word because they don't need to use the word. Right. I would say, honestly, I always joke that, like, if you're grinding, you probably don't love it enough. And that's not quite true. Like, we have days of teaching. We're kind of grinding through the day. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not flowing well. You're having a bad day, et cetera. You're kind of grinding through the day. To me, a grind has a negative connotation to it. You know, uh, there's just no nice word for doing what's required. <laughs> Correct. No, nothing that sounds cool anyways. Uh oh, there goes the sound again. Come on, Internet. Oh, no, is that you got it now. Oh, you're good now. OK, like I, I think that just like the grind has such a negative connotation to it uh, on your grind means it's hard. Yeah, it's hard, but it's what's required. Mm -hmm. You and I went to school. You and I went to school for X amount of years because what was required is we take classes to get our, our licensure. But we did it because we wanted to do this. You know what yep. I mean? So I don't know necessarily if that's I don't know. It's and I it could be a super unpopular opinion, but it's an opinion I don't mind dying on. Most of my opinions I don't mind dying I was on. Say, I, <laughs> alongside all the rest of them. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's no yeah, I, I can't lie there. That's you know what the kids say, no cap. No cap. <laughs> yeah. So I can definitely <laughs> remember a personal story when I think it was my first or second year teaching up with or uh, coaching up at Legacy and I remember walking in I it must have been early March early in the season or maybe a second who knows I cannot remember the exact time of year but I remember coming into the gym and just sitting there and you clearly saw that I must have had a rough day at school and you're like how you doing and I just kind of like I don't need to I want to talk about this right now and 20 minutes later you came by and you basically said you need to take a day off tomorrow and like to me as a young educator i'm like no i don't need to do that i'll figure it out we'll be fine tomorrow and i think about an hour later you came up and you said you take that day off yet like i didn't think you were being for real like i'm like that's that's not a thing no i need to go teach tomorrow because that's my job this was like right when i'm i'm sure right when i was married or right before i got married obviously before 
Cohen was born. But I remember you you sat down towards the end of practice and said, you're not leaving this gym until I see that sub note on your ASOP. Right. So you better pull yeah. it up. And I took the next day off, and I was brand spanking new for the next month. Right. So it's a, it definitely you know, taught I, me something. As, as a young educator and coach, it taught me – like you, it's okay to do this. Like every, all of us do this. This is how we're able to do this for this long. Yeah. I, I think that there's a negative connotation with those kind of things. I think myself, I've learned in the past, well, probably since my, my mom has passed about trying to take care of myself a little more. Um, and understanding that, yeah, every now and then you just need a day and it's not even a day to really do anything. Maybe it's just a day to get yourself together, get organized, uh, you know, clean the house, sort your Google drive, lesson plan do something that that fills your cup right i think me and a couple of educators i work with um mrs han and, and mr towns and we talk about trying to fill our cup all the time and do some things that are that but it's also another reason why i do love young people i mean young people have a drive most of our staff is fairly young besides mm-hmm. me and, and Patton, with Patton being older than most coaches around uh but I like hiring young people. I think it's it's fun to we're experienced. Like I might not uh, not all my experience might be positive, but it's an experience nonetheless. Where here's what happened when I did this. Here's what happened when we do this. And I've been super unbelievably fortunate to teach around some phenomenal teachers. My mentor Christy Freed has been um, a blessing. I go to her with everything, and she that was the one thing she had always talked to me about when I first started. For those who don't know, Bismarck Public Schools. If you're a new teacher, you get a mentor. Mm -hmm. And so 10 years ago when I started teaching, Christy was my mentor. And one of the first things she was like, do everything you can not to take it home with you. Like do everything you can at school to not take your home or to take your work with you home, whether that's grading papers, putting in grades, lesson plans. She's like, do what you got to do during the day. But when you roll out of here at the end of the day, try not to take it home with you. And I remember it was one of those things where like you're young and, and I wasn't young at the time. I was a little older, but um you're all fired up about the year. You're, you're working at home, lesson plans, mm-hmm. grading papers, you're doing everything. And then finally you're like, boy, I am tired. And it's October. October. You know what I mean? And so that was when she was like, no, you like take a day or just this week, don't take anything home with you. So when you go home, cause I don't hadn't didn't coach anything in the fall. When you go home, you can just be at home, you know? And then when your kid gets home, you be with your kid. And it's one of the first things I sort of learned there. I don't take that advice for myself all that often. I probably is something I should do. Um, but yeah, I think taking care of ourselves in these type of seasons are, are a lot. I mean, it's, it's something I think the outsider wouldn't see. I, I joke that I have a, a, there's a kid from you, Mary, his name's Cody Jones, Cody with a K on, on the, on the TikTok. He does a lot of videography stuff for um, Mary and, and some high school stuff. And I debated this year doing like a day in the life. Like, hmm. like people like see what my day is. I want them to come like March 19th, dude. So it's like that Tuesday of, of tryouts yeah. where like all of our tryout stuff is done. And now I have to do all the admin work that night because I have school the next day. We have practice right after school. We need to make cuts. So come with me on a day. And so you can see what a day of a coach is instead hmm. of seeing him going back to that first interaction with a player, instead of just seeing him for a 10 second snippet you getting after a player like come with me and mic me up to the conversations we have at practice see what that grind is like but it's 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 a lot right like that that grind Mm -hmm. of getting up every morning it's a lot um and i think you got to make sure that you take care of yourself man it's as i get older it's the one thing that i don't know if i'll i know i'll still compromise at times but there are times when i'll say nope i can't no more you know you gotta take care of yourself it is a lot a lot, a lot. I can't really see myself doing anything else at the moment. There's, I know I've talked talked to several educators who have just at Lincoln and such that we've talked in the past couple of weeks, not about leaving education, but thinking about what would what would we be good at? And it eventually led to you realize that the skill set that teachers have in so many areas could do so many jobs better than other people just because of how we're wired and what our motor does every day. See, T T tried to tell me that we were just talking about like long term stuff, right? Because I'm at how many years is this for you? What, what year is this for you in the district? My eighth year total, sixth in BPS. Yep. So this will be like this is my tenth, like of in the classroom. I've been in BPS for like 14 years. And um I go, if I were to get a because you get that weird, like, you know, almost midsection of like yep. when you can retire. 
And I'm like, even if I got a different job, I don't know what the hell I do. She goes, you'd be amazed at the, the skills that you have with teaching would lend themselves to other jobs. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know anything about anything else. It's all, it's all I've ever done. I don't, I'm like, the only thing I could probably do is maybe go slang some t-shirts or something like that. A joke with Chris <laughs> game one. Like, Hey man, I, I know, I know all the product. I know I could, I could, I could, I could you know what I mean? I got enough relationships. I could slang all the baseball equipment you got, but I don't know what else we would do. But I mean, I think that it'd be amazing for somebody. I joke with my wife as well. Like you come hang out with me for a day and see how, how it is and see the amount of skills needed to get through to a kid that you have for, I mean, you're probably lucky enough. not the word, but you have your kids all day. There's a mm -hmm. kid who I might have an hour and a half every other day. Yep. Who, who we're trying to get through and, and the skills that you got to come up with for those kind of things. But creativity. Yeah. yeah. And that stuff weighs on you, man. I mean, it's when you're in this profession, it's hard for those things not to affect you when you're trying to help young people. And so it really does. I mean, it takes a toll on you. I think more of my stress is less for me and much, much more for like thinking about other kids and what they want to do or need or any of that mm -hmm. stuff. All of my time is based on that. Agreed. So probably the, the biggest kind of ending piece to all of this conversation is I have relationships highlighted, which I've talked to, to so many people on here, but we know it's such a big part of coaching, such a big part yeah. of teaching and just such a big part of life. If you look at it, just an overarching perspective, but kind of the angle I want to look at it and just the angle I viewed it through watching you interact with, um, the high school players that we have, because I'm such a big proponent, obviously, at the elementary school level, the relationships. I mean, I can I can walk down our hallway at Lincoln and 90 percent of the kids just <laughs> know who I am. I don't know what their name is, but I'm also yeah. one of the male school, one of the male teachers so here. You're, you're going to get the popular card no matter what you do in an elementary school teacher as a male teacher. So I know how important that relationship piece is. So when I came up to the high school level and I'd been in middle schools, like um, I would sub in at Simley yep. for a while with Voorhees and some other people after I got done student teaching. And so I, again, understood relationships at every level, but in my head, I was like relationships at elementary, that's, that's like top tier. That's, that's the most important piece of it. But then I know you've already talked about um, connecting with these guys and knowing their slang and knowing what YouTube they're watching, knowing what TikToks they're watching, knowing what's going on in their lives. And um, so I, so I hi have highlighted age level makes no difference. Um, like I said, just just observing you every every practice. And I know I've followed a lot of these guys. I have Ike on social media. I got I talked to Butsy. I yeah. talked to Crew. I go to You Mary games. I see Pigors. And again, those relationships carry on as long as you want them to. So um, the unique part with with your job is you teach at Simley and you coach at Legacy. So you you've known these kids for years. You've known these kids since they were right. like, what, sixth graders, and Probably, you yeah. have the opportunity to coach them as long as they keep playing until they're seniors so how big of an of an advantage is that for you especially from relation relationship standpoint now i'm talking too fast um <laughs> is good. it for you, you to, to have these kids for so long and just just to know them as people before they even walk into the program yeah i think it's a, i think it's a i think it's a very large discrepancy from it's a super advantage and it's a large disadvantage the reason being is again i'm not going to bat a thousand with every kid so there's some kids who might come through simly let's say the little behavior issue etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm in a position of leadership there a sub in the office where like some of my interactions with those kids might not necessarily be all that positive and then all of a sudden they come into my program and i want all of the interactions to be positive and informative and um character building and so sometimes it has the adverse effect where maybe a kid is around you too much, right? But for the most part, it's been a super advantage because kids get to know who I am and how I operate. Um, and not saying I try to hold it over their head, but there's those conversations where we're lucky enough at Simley to have a lot of um, high school coaches in our in our building. A lot of, almost all of our male staff at Simley are former male athletes of some sort of college athletes. Um, myself, Ross and Lamar, both the Jolliffs, um, Tyler Wesley, Luke Mormon, right? Voorhees, um, Lambert's the AP. He was a, a football player at Mary. Yep. Bergard was the baseball player at Jamestown. Like we have a bunch of former athletes who some of these kids you just talk to like, hey, 
Like you better get it together because this won't fly at the next level. Like if these are really your goals, like it's not going to fly in those programs. Um, but for the most part, I would say 90% of it has been an unbelievably large advantage just because I get to know those kids and who they are and how they operate and follow them and also have that ability where they ask me questions on things, even at times where I can't work with them or, um, you know, as they come up or following them in the summer um, and being able to go to their games. It's been great. And I think the relationships are a big part. Um, I just think sometimes teachers and coaches are afraid of that because it opens you up for more, I'll say criticism, but again, just more of those things when you want to be take responsibility for a kid and have that quality relationship with them. Um, but I'd take that over anything else. I think the other part of it would be too boring. Um, but it's been really uh, an advantage. I think the best part is you, you can show the kids you're invested in them, right? Like, again, I'm not asking for a transaction. I'm not giving you A so you could give me B, right? I want to just give you B so you have success. And I want to give you knowledge or go about finding somebody to help you with that knowledge um, and the relationship thing like you had mentioned the the grade level it really doesn't matter the age level you have to have good relationships with with all of the people who you deem important in your life again i i hire young people so you you're how old i just turned 30 a couple of weeks ago right so you just turned 30 so you think of our staff last year me and jim were the only ones on over the age of 30 Right. Mm -hmm. I, I was 39. Jim was 50 or something like that. And then you, Lane, Yak, Sigs, all those guys are all in their 20s. Mm -hmm. Even this year, Dill's a few years older than you. Dill's, I think Dill turns 30 here. Just He's in the same class as me. I think he's a couple, a month. I want to say he turns 30 sometime in January. Right. So you think like Dill again. Um, and the reason is like you think about how much how much closer you are to our kids from an age standpoint mm. than I am from you. Like it's the same distance, right? But my relationship with my assistants need to be as strong as possible and their relationships with them needs to be as strong as possible, but we're all in the same playing field. Like it doesn't really, I don't get how you can differentiate between the, the type of relationship is probably different, mm. right? Like I can text my players you know, you're probably not texting your students, you know what no. I'm saying? Like it's those kind of things, right? So the medium obviously changes, but your value of what you want to give to them and your caring about those kids never changes. At least it shouldn't. If to me, if you're in it for the transactional piece where you're just looking for those kids to give you something that just seems like you're so outcome based that it, it doesn't seem all that enjoyable. And it seems like you're letting the day go by with stuff. Again, so many of our conversations have nothing to do with baseball, right? Mm -hmm. They have to do with life and how you go about things and how you can how you can use the game of baseball to teach them about some life things. So, um, to me, I think relationships are are tough, no doubt about it. It takes time, but I think at the end of the day, that risk of those things are so much worth it. Like the juice is so worth the squeeze. You know, these kids are like my oldest kids. They treat my youngest like there's one of their own. Like you've seen Boston around the yard, like he gets to come in there and those kids are so good to him. Even in the summertime when they don't see him, but in the summer, um, those Mandan kids love him to death and, and treat him so well. And, and my relationships with those guys are unbelievable, too. And it's it's something I wouldn't give up. It's the one thing that when I eventually get done coaching, whenever that is, they're going to ask, what are you going to miss? And it probably will be that. I don't think it'll be game day stuff. It won't be the admin stuff. It won't be practice. It'll be legitimately fostering relationships with kids um, every day throughout the season and, and being around those kids and supporting those kids for, for life. And it's been a super cool to have former players and players around that area, era of places I've coached want to come back and help coach. You know, I mean, you think about Jim being a part of our program and you guys playing for him there. And Oli, you and Dill, and Lane and Trav being at Mary, um, Sigity playing for me, um, and those different, it's its super awesome. But those all come from the relationships that we've formed over the past, you know, 20 years or mm -hmm. 15 years, right? So it's its something, again, now, like, you look at that, it might not have meant a bunch 15 years ago, but it means the world now. Like, I'll see those guys more than I'll see my own family starting in a couple months. Yeah. You know, those relationships need to be good. They need to be good. And it's also nice where other coaches, 
other coaches see that too. We've had multiple comments and multiple people like, Hey, your coaches actually hang out. Like, yeah, we do. Like we actually enjoy each other's time. We actually, you know, our text thread is one of my favorite things throughout the the year, (laughs) right? Like we're daily, it gets going off about things. And, and also like both funny and both like super productive. Like, Hey, I think about like this, what do you think about this? And, and just fostering each other's, uh, you know, thoughts and, and building upon those and supporting, ideas that we have and and even getting coaches sort of out of their shell with again taking a personal day when you need it like that's that's a win and going back to the the state title thing that's more important to me than that say that state title will happen when it happens but me not giving the most each day for a kid whose career is probably two years maybe you know we've been lucky enough to have kids a little longer but for the most part those high school kids two through two three years if i don't give everything in the, during my 10 11 weeks during those three years then I probably did them a disservice. Correct. I was going to sign off with that. This podcast is sponsored by Yoli, but I don't know anybody who could help me with that. So I don't know if I yeah. contact to get that information. There's, so. How many? I like. Okay, hold on. There. <laughs> if this went to the right people, it'd be perfect. It'd be perfect if they could. If they I might could, know a couple if, people. If they like, we get some Yoli up in here. Like those of you on the inside joke, like you could DM. DM myself or <laughs> or Kyler to ask what's the Yoli joke, man, because we'll tell you all about it. It's uh, that's Travis one of the Spain better things. Has contact information on that. I'll have to I'll have to check into that. <laughs> Famous I mean, is probably in chicken nuggets in a bathroom stall somewhere. I mean, there's, whew, there's somebody at one point we gotta like like the what do they call it in law, right? We're like it's been a long enough time, <laughs> you know what I mean? To where now like people can talk about that stuff. And you just dial, like, could find it, I bet. like I want to get like 30 boxes on here and we'll get <laughs> Diley Somerville. We'll get uh, we'll get all them cats on this bad boy and we'll just like line the screen with boxes and everybody's got to go through and tell at least one Yoli joke. Oh, Cause, God. Because you get I, through it. Between, I probably need the tissues laughing so hard. But between Yoli, the high socks and the lateness. <laughs> That could be a five-hour five podcast. Yoli, lateness, and the high socks. Everybody everybody uh, have that and see how it goes. I got I got on the plane last weekend, and some Yahoo, right as they were closing at somebody's freaking out coming on, and my buddy who came with me, he's like, he's like, how can you be this late? And in my head, I'm like, I know somebody who has been later than that. Yeah, that's, that's Justin. Was it 6 a.m.? Because he wasn't there. I'll tell uh, you right now. You're taking bets on the bus when the coach is going to show up. Not That's not right. a good situation to be in. That's but before right. we do sign off, I know um, people who are watching this on YouTube can see your hat, but people who are just listening, you want to share a minute about what short hop baseball is all about? Yeah, so I kind of sort of, um, you know, I, I think that there's so much opportunity for, for growth and development in Bismarck Mandan. So I kind of I started my own company called Short Hop LLC. Um, the logo, if you guys can't see it, is is this guy here. Um, it's my grandfather. That's his AAA card. Um, so that's his logo on the hat. And Short Hop is basically just me doing some private stuff, developing. You know, I'm I would say that I don't do all encompassing though. I'm I'm not I'm not one of them that will. I can't do like pitching, for example. I mean, I probably could give you some tips and tricks, but I don't think it'd be worth your time to have me tell you about it. But um, defense and hitting, like just some just some individual stuff, group work. Um, no, I don't care where you're from, who you are, what position you play. I think that there's an opportunity for baseball doesn't isn't taken quite serious enough around here. And I get it. There's going to be kings of sports always here, right? like football, basketball, track are, are going to rule the world here, I think, forever. But if you look at the kind of players that Bismarck is putting out the past four or five years, it's some pretty quality talent. I mean, you want to take, you know, I think Skyler's got a chance to get drafted out of NDSU this year. Kate did. We're going to have, you know, four or five kids um, this year in the city go play college baseball. Some kids from Mandan go play college baseball. I mean, we're churning out quality college athletes for a sport that doesn't get a lot of tick just because there's not a lot of places to develop or a lot of people, I think, that can make you actually better at things. And I think like people like myself and Travis Stevens, who's worked with me, him and Mikey Paulson did a, a camp in Mandan that was great. And some guys that are helping me out, I think we actually can do that. And so it's just more or less a thought to try to improve 
players in the game of baseball around here. I think you look around the summer and so many kids play baseball, but not enough kids know how to play baseball. You know what I mean? Um, whether it's they get too mechanical, whether they are stuck in old practices, whether they are stuck in sort of facilities, right? But me being able to have the ability to sort of book some facilities, even though I don't have my own, and just try to make kids better at baseball. I mean, it's been a slow, slow go of it so far, but it's been super fun meeting different kids in different age groups and, and working on crafts. But I think baseball has so many more quality moments and and quality people in it that we sort of need to start developing that. I think BYB eventually will get there. I know Mandan does a great job of it. And I just kind of want to be a part of it. And also, like, eventually, like you and I have talked about here, like, I'm not going to coach forever. But I still want to stay in the game, right? I, I'm really – one of my biggest next nervous life moments is – as I, it's probably a little too harsh. But, like, older people, they go break a hip. They talk about, like, your life expectancy after a certain age when you do those kind of things is really short because you become immobile, right? You see some of these coaches who stay in the game until their 70s, right? And I think that that's where I want to make sure that I love this game so much. I want to give back to it, that that's what I continue to do to sort of fill my cup, right? Where now like short hop is going to allow me to do that, where even more than coaching a team, seeing a kid develop and do well fills my cup a lot. And I feel like I owe it to the game still to give back. So short hop was just founded on the the thought process that I made him my logo just as a reminder, because he did help me through some hard times and with the player that I've become and, and trying to just sort of give that back to the baseball world. Cause I think you and I can both attest there's too many quality baseball things going on for the amount of places that we get to develop. And you mm -hmm. think that it, Mark, there's maybe what, two places, three it's that. Kids, kids can access on a, on a continuous basis. Um, I mean, you wonder why <laughs> football's hot King. I mean, you can do football all summer basketball. There's yeah. a hoop on every corner. You know, going to a baseball facility in the wintertime around here is really tough. Um, but I think that with some work and, and some true planning, I think we can get there to make baseball um, a much bigger deal, a much bigger deal. I even I joke with some people of high ranking and sometimes, again, get myself in trouble for talking. But like PSP and, and some of these other places, they do so many basketball games and, and football games. I can't wait till they start to do baseball because I think it'll open up a whole horizon of mm -hmm. all that plays baseball oh that kid's best sport is baseball yeah oh i didn't know that well you, yeah, of course like and you wouldn't right because you're not going to make it out to a game when it's cold mm -hmm. right when summer hits you're probably not going to the yard unless you have a a vested interest right um so i think that right now is a big turning point in the city for something like baseball to really turn a corner and to develop because we have just as good athletes just as good as skilled players i would wager a guess that there are so many people who have better skill in baseball than they have in their other sports. They're just athletic enough to play their other sports. Yeah. So I'm hoping that, you know, long-term I can be involved with, you know, in it or, or have a piece of trying to develop the baseball town around here. Cause now, I mean, I'm here, I'm here for life and, and I want to continue to do the things that help fill my cup. And part of that is just giving back. Absolutely. I love it. And I'm all about it. Happy to help market it. Got to get, got to get some merch first. Got to, start showing I, it off it's like that that's like the sponsorship thing right i think what i <laughs> i also have a problem making people pay for stuff so like for example these hats i had i don't know 20 something of them and i've handed them all out and guys like what do i owe you it's like well nothing just wear it like i appreciate <laughs> it but then there's gonna come a time where like people are like yo let's get some stuff and i'm like i'd love to but i also gotta make enough <laughs> to buy it you know, so you don't have to so I could just, you know, even in business, like try to operate at a negative. Well, you still have have the money to be negative kind of a deal. You know what I mean? So um, we'll get there. I know Chris at, at game one, if you guys need stuff, man, go see Chris. He's good people. He's trying to help me with all those different things and try to get some kind of online store and such. But um, it's a long term process, too. I've only been really going after it for a couple of months. And we all know that the months of November, December, January are kind of tough from a kids to want to work on baseball right i mean it's yeah that basketball super heavy and oh and hockey probably. is wild yeah. hockey takes over football season in october it's ridiculous uh, yeah. hockey is something man. that's that's a different that's a different well, we have a whole nother podcast it's to discuss. gonna get me started on that one so yeah but i mean it's uh it'll be good i mean it'll it'll you know trying to do some camps and some stuff eventually and and i think that 
also I'm lucky enough to have a platform to do those kind of things and have the support of, of people to get it out there. And so we'll see, we'll see how it goes, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just continuing to try to give back and, and try to, to make players better. I've been fortunate enough to be around a, a unbelievable set of coaches in my career and guys who have made me better and um, humble brag. I think I've made some kids decent um, and given them the opportunity to, to help them manifest their dreams of, of going to play college and, and we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly learning. And like I said, I out with Coach Spencer and the older guys, seeing how my philosophies work with the older guys and being have, able to have more of those mature conversations, right? Because they got to take a little more ownership of their development and, and just trying to learn every day new things. And, and so it's exciting. I, there's, there's just such a big window for kids to get better at this sport without just naturally being athletically gifted, where I think you can go work on some skill and be awesome. So we'll see, man. We'll see. Sounds good. Well, aside from making your players better, you've definitely made me a better coach, better teacher, better person. I appreciate all that you've done for myself, done for, I mean, my family. I've been able to step away from baseball when I've needed to without any hesitation or without any need feeling of need to be somewhere else so i know when i came back for a couple days last year i know butsy sat next to me and he goes do you miss this and i said i don't miss the schedule but i miss this i miss this 100 no doubt about it and i appreciate i mean i think i think it's been awesome and i and again from the culture standpoint i myself went through that when i when i was coaching and had my first kid and you know what the time constraints are and and it's super important to me that guys who come into our program as long as you want to be a part of something like you'll have a, a home here at legacy and and obviously being able to try to treat everybody like family and get together and and again still having that it's an easier deal when you're common when your goal is common right like we we all want what's best for the kids we we pay mostly with our time and time is one of the more valuable things you can have so um the fact that you still want to do it while doing all the other things getting your masters doing this fatherhood like it's a lot so it's it's uh it's awesome that you still do it but i do appreciate it i know the thank is awesome, but at the end of the day, you still have to be the one to do it. You know what I mean? Give yourself some credit. Yeah, plenty to it. So appreciate you for joining me. It was a great conversation. I'll get it all readied up and send it out. So all right, brother. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, appreciate you. Have a good one. All right, buddy. See you. Bye.